So thank you for coming. And tonight's going to be session eight of 12, and it's part two of in six days. Uh, I have really, last week I really liked that topic, and tonight uh, it also is good stuff. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word, and I pray, Father, that your word would be powerful in our lives, and we would know your word and receive your word as it is intended to be known, as it is intended to be received, and as it is intended to be communicated as truth. I pray that you would do that in us in Jesus' name. Amen. Biblical authority. Biblical authority. The issue of our generation is biblical authority. I'm not sure that it is a different issue in any generation. Maybe more of a degree today because the church is starting to abandon biblical authority. So if you take away biblical authority, something's going to fill the void. Human reasoning. So what is our absolute source of authority? And I want to communicate something we don't talk about much here at the church, but it'd probably be good for me to share, is that in this church, I think the, the, the non-denominational Christian church overall has a pretty unique perspective on biblical authority. We don't have any creeds. We don't have any... Um, we don't have a convention that votes on issues. We don't have... Uh, bylaws in respect to doctrine I guess we do this is it we really don't have some I remember I have a conversation with a preacher a few years ago and he said what what do your what do your uh, uh, bylaws say about these doctrinal issues I said we don't have bylaws on doctrinal issues what do you mean you don't have bylaws on doctrinal issues? this is it we really don't have something else why would I need something else? Now, I say that, well, I say this. We do have position papers on some issues, but all the position papers are is so that we make sure the leadership of the church, the staff, the elders, all speak with one voice, and all the position papers are are statements and the Scripture. Statement and the Scripture. There's really no commentary. It's just statement and the Scripture to make sure that on some of the key social issues that some people have a tendency to struggle with, the church takes a position. But our position is totally based on a chapter and a verse. Every position we take in those papers has a chapter and a verse behind it so that this is our authority. This is it. So, when I say that, I ask this question, is there an absolute truth? So if you might, I know when I say that, some people think, what does that mean? Is there an absolute truth or is there relative truth? And the difference is somebody says to you, that might have been true then, but it's not true now. Well, let me just tell you, if it was true then, it's true now, because the whole definition of truth is it doesn't change. Truth doesn't become false. If truth becomes false, it wasn't true. Okay? Somebody else will say this. Um, that might have been, that's okay for you. That may be truth for you, but it's not truth for me. That's called relative truth. And truth dependent upon your perspective. See, we hold to a absolute truth. And here's why. I want, I want to explain where we're coming from. We believe there's an authority greater than us. The absolute truth comes not from any human being. That there is an authority greater than us. There's someone above us, higher than us, that knows more than us. And He has delivered to us truth. And, and, and we, sub, in, in this, we subject ourselves to the authority of that truth. Because in my perspective, to subject myself to the authority of truth is to subject myself to God. 
I can't find any difference. And, and in fact, that's going to kind of be the topic tonight. If I refuse to subject myself to what I'm holding over my head, these words, who am I actually refusing to subject myself to? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John? Who? God. So, is the Bible perfect? Is it infallible? And when I say that, in its original language, unless somebody misinterprets from its original language, has God given us a perfect text, a perfect word, an infallible description of himself, us, past, future. My opinion is yes. And you know what? I'm willing to bet the whole farm on that issue. I'm betting, I, you know, you see a poker game, they throw all their chips in, that's what I'm doing. I'm throwing all the chips in that I believe what I hold in my hand is the only physical source of absolute truth on this planet. And to submit to the authority of this word is to submit to the authority of this word giver. See, the Bible is the word of God just as if he were here in this room behind me in a white glowy cloud speaking. I don't see any difference. I would be a little bit more afraid if he was behind me in a white glowy cloud speaking. I should say that. See, I don't, I don't see any difference. I don't see any difference. Um, I believe God's Word is God's Word. And I, I'm going to show you in a minute why I say that. In fact, I'm afraid that it will all come down to that. I'm afraid that in the end, it'll all come down to this. What did you do with this word? Because this word revealed God. It revealed salvation. It revealed his person, who he is, what he did to save you, how you can be saved, and what happens if you don't. It's in this book. And I believe when it all said and done, it's going to come down to this. What did you do with those words I gave you? Well, I was waiting for some new words. Well, that's not going to work. Not going to work. So let's begin with John chapter 1. Here we go. In the beginning, the Word already existed. You can't read John 1 without a question mark in your mind. In the beginning, the Word. What's that mean? And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. So, who is He? It's a person. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So, one thing's clear when I read that. Whatever this Word is, He speaks for God. They have one voice. Whatever God says, this Word says. They, they are separate. They're, they're identified in this text as two different people but they're together, and they speak the same word. Are you with me? In the beginning, what beginning? I'm going to say it's Genesis 1. That's our beginning. The word already existed in Genesis 1. He, and we went through that in Hebrews. You know, uh, Jesus does not find his origins in Bethlehem. He did not become the Son of God when he became the child of Mary. He was the Son of God before the foundation of the earth. Okay? I don't have time to go on that tonight. I've already done that before. In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God. In, when? In the beginning. And the Word was God. When? In the beginning. He, it, it, so that tells me it's a person. He existed in the beginning with God. But they're separate, but they're together. But they, the, the Word speaks for the Father, but they're the same voice. Verse 3, God created everything through Him. Who? The Word. God the Father created everything through Him. He's a person. His name is the Word, but He's a person. And nothing was created except through Him. Anything that is anything found its beginning in the what? 
in the Word. Verse 4, the Word gave life to everything that was created, and His life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish the light. How did the Apostle John, here's, here's a deep question, how did the Apostle John know that in the beginning the Word, how did the Apostle John know that in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God? Because in, John wasn't there in the beginning. In fact, the beginning was 4,000 years before John was born. So how does John know what happened in the beginning? <laughs> how? The Word. Anybody see where this is going? So let me, let me just kind of cut to the chase. So if you're one of those people who say, I believe in Jesus, I don't believe, just don't believe the Bible. I, I, I'm just, I've almost lost patience with people who say that to me anymore. I'm, I'm just saying, how in the world did you even know who Jesus was if it weren't for that Bible? How in the world did you ever figure him out? Well, I believe in Jesus, I just don't believe in this book. How did John know that the Word was with God and the Word was God? He wasn't there. How did, how did he get that information? How did John know that all things were made by the Word and that Jesus is the only light and life of men? So let's go to, I'm going to use the NIV to repeat verse 5. John 1, 5. Here we go. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. Now here, this is big for tonight. This is big. The light shines in the darkness. This is the, after in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made through Him. Okay. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness didn't what? Understand it. What didn't they understand? My goodness, surely you got it by now. The Word. What didn't, they, what didn't the darkness understand? How many times does it have to be put in a paragraph for us to get it? What didn't they understand? The light shines in the darkness. Well, what's the light? Jesus. Who's Jesus? The Word. The, light the Word shines in the darkness. So are they synonymous? Are they the same? Yes. So let's put that word in there. The word shines in the darkness, but the darkness does not understand the word. Anybody get it? Anybody understand now why there's a spiritual battle going on in the world? Because the darkness, you say, well, they don't understand Jesus. They don't understand Jesus because they don't understand the word. Because if you can figure out the word, you'll find Jesus. If you, if you believe the Word, Jesus is in there. So, I want to do something, and I'm going to do it real quick, okay? I just went to one chapter. Now, I know it's a pretty long chapter, but Psalms 119 kind of does in the Psalms what John does in the first five verses of his gospel. What? He beats you over the head with the Word, Okay? In other words, when Psalms 119 is finished, if you, if you still don't really pay any attention to the Word, I think there's not much hope because you're never going to get it. So here we go, real fast. I'm just, I'm just going to hit the highlights. How can a young man keep his way pure? The Word, by living according to the Word. I've hidden your Word in my heart. I delight in your decrees. I will never... Neglect your word. I'm laid low in the dust. Preserve my life. How? According to your word. My soul is weary with sorrow. Strengthen me. How? According to your word. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life. How? According to your word. Then I'll answer the one who taunts me. For I trust. How will I answer somebody who taunts me? I trust in your word. Do good to your servant. What's the basis of good? According to your word. 
Before I was afflicted, I went astray. Now, I'm not astray anymore. What did I find that kept me from going astray? Your word. May those who fear you rejoice when they see me. For I have put my hope in what? Your word. My soul faints with longing for salvation. But I have put my hope in your word. Your word is eternal. I have kept my feet from every evil path so that I might obey your word. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. Preserve my life according to your word. My hope is in your word. Direct my footsteps according to your word. I have put my hope in your word. I must, I, for they, the, the faithless ones, do not obey your word. Rulers persecute me without cause, but my heart trembles. I'm not afraid of those people, but my heart trembles at your word. May my cry come before you. Oh Lord, give me understanding according to your word. May my tongue sing of your word, for all your commands are righteous. And jumping from 119 over to Psalms 138. Two things. I'm going to tell you what. When this one hit me, it just like kind of shook me. This is Psalms 138. I will bow down toward your holy temple and will praise your name for your love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things two things. Don't go out of here tonight and not get this. For you have exalted above all things two things. What are the two things? Your name and your word. How many of you remember what John wrote to the church at Philadelphia in the book of Revelation? I'll give you the highlights. It's one of the seven churches in the book of Revelation. Jesus told John, write it down. This is my message to the church at Philadelphia. He says, because you have not abandoned my name and my word. Same two things. That's why I say, when I, when I read this, it's like, whoa. Because you did not abandon my name and my word. I will protect you from the great time of testing that is going to come upon the whole world to prove who they belong to. What two things... Did Jesus the church for? You held on to two things. He says, I know you have little strength. And they were facing great opposition. But in the opposition, you held on to, just, just hold on to two things. In fact, what's amazing about these two things? Some of y'all are going to get ahead of me. What's amazing about these two things? They're the same thing. The name and the Word. What's Jesus' name in John 1? The Word. What's the Word in John 1? Jesus. What's going to happen if you let go of those two things? Let me read that again. I will bow down toward your holy temple and will praise your name for your love and your faithfulness for you have exalted above all things your name and your Word. So, all of that so I can say this and set up the uh, movie tonight or the teaching session. Is the issue of six literal 24-hour days of creation a matter of salvation? No. No, it's not. I told you last week, you're not going to get to heaven. He's going to test you whether or not you believe that there were six literal 24 hours. That's not on the test. But I'm going to tell you what is on the test. Listen, listen. I am going to tell you what's on the test. What did, how did you respond to my word? Because re how you respond to that word is how you respond to his son. They are the same. Now do you see it's, you can't separate them. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That is on the test. It's not about six literal 24-hour days, but it's about the authority of Scripture. 
Our faith is based on something. If I went around the church and asked you, what is salvation? How are we literally saved? We're saved by grace through faith. Right? Almost everybody in the church knows that. We're saved by grace. That's God's mercy offered us a chance. So what's our, if that's God's part, mercy or grace, what's our part? Faith. I have to believe it. So I'm going to ask you a question. Your faith is saving faith has to be in something. Which means I believe, but it means you have to believe something. So the Bible tells you what saving faith is. Verse 17, Romans chapter 10. Consequently, faith comes, if faith is what saves you, then you need to figure out where faith comes from, right? Faith comes from hearing the message. Well, where did you get the message? From the word. Faith comes from hearing and from the faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard how? Through the word of Christ or the word of God. Now, that's NIV. Below it I put the NLT and I added verse 18. So faith comes from hearing that is hearing the good news or the gospel about Christ. But I ask, have the people of Israel actually heard the message? Yes, they have. The message has gone out throughout the earth, the words to all the world. So this gospel is going all over the world. And by the way, that is on the test. Let's watch the video.
Do you know what word is used in the New Testament more than any other word to describe Christians? Believers. Isn't that interesting? You know what the, the world called us in the first century? Believers. Believers in what? Jesus. What's Jesus' name? The Word. Some of you might be struggling right now with this whole authority issue. Can I say that I think the church in America is struggling with the authority issue. This is not some sideline issue. This is foundational. And to me it's interesting is that what the church is struggling with today is exactly what Satan did to Eve in the garden. Did God really say? Isn't that interesting? Because today, what's the world say? Did God really say? Are you sure? Are you, are you sure about that? So let's, let's do this as we, as we kind of close up tonight. In John chapter 17 in the New Testament, Jesus uh, is nearing the end of his ministry and he calls his closest disciples together and he prays a prayer of intercession for the disciples. In fact, this prayer is Jesus, it's recorded, John records Jesus talking to his father, okay? Okay. Jesus talking to his father. Now, if you want to learn a lot, just read Jesus talking to his father, okay? And he's not talking to his father asking for something for himself. He's kind of talking to his father on behalf of all these disciples because he knows before too long he's leaving. Jesus is going to take his seat at the right hand of the father and they're going to be down here on this earth in this spiritual battle. So, Jesus, John 17 is an intercessory prayer between Jesus and the Father. Look at verse 6. Jesus says, I have received, excuse me, I have revealed you. So who's you? Father. Jesus says, I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. In other words, the only way they're going to get it is they got to come out of the world to get it. Because in the world means you belong to Satan. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me. And they have obeyed what? What's the, what's the, what's the mark of their identity? They have obeyed your word. Is that important? Jesus is talking to his father, and he says, your word. Now, if you study John 1, what is his word? It's the one talking to the father. Right? Let's go to verse 14. Jesus, again, same prayer. He's talking to the father. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them. Why did the world hate them? Because they got the word. Why does that make them hate them? Because now, because they got the word, they don't belong to the world anymore. Now they belong to you, Father. And that's why the world hates them. I, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them. For they are not of the world anymore, any more than I'm of the world. What distinguishes, listen, this is really important. What distinguishes the people of the world in this verse and the people of God? What distinguishes? What is the distinguishing characteristic that separates those two? The Word. Right? One more, verse 17. Jesus says, sanctify them. You know what sanctify means? Set them apart. Render them holy. Pull them out of the world and make them holy. Sanctify them by the truth. And then Jesus says, well, your word is truth. So I'm going to ask you a question. If sanctification means rendered holy, what renders a person holy? 
the truth. What's the truth? The Word. So let me kind of ask a crazy question. Because I've had this brought to me over the years. Just the red letters? <laughs> I had somebody ask me that. But okay, okay, preacher, you got my attention. Uh, you know, I'll go through some of this stuff. And then, okay, preacher, you got my attention. But that only refers to what Jesus says. And I'll say, uh, 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 uh. You know why? Jesus quotes the black letters. Uh, 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 uh. When Jesus encounters Satan in the wilderness, what does he quote? Red letters? He quotes the Old Testament. He quotes the Old Testament. He's not... In fact, they became red letters when he said it in the Gospels. We wrote them in red letters. By the way, the original writings didn't have black and red letters, okay? So we kind of put that part in there because it makes it a little easier. So I've had people say that when they read, if it says, and Jesus said, oh, I've got to pay attention to that. But when Peter says it, or Paul, well, that's just his opinion. John, what's his opinion? Did Jesus write that red letter? Or was it John that actually wrote it while Jesus was living inside of him? The Holy Spirit. All Scripture is God-breathed and is given by God. It's useful for teaching, correcting, rebuking, a man, a woman, what? So that you'll know right from wrong, up from down, good from evil. So what am I supposed to do with this? You know, we can go through all this and miss the main point if we're not careful. What am I supposed to do with this? I believe what I hold in my hands is the only physical source of absolute truth on this earth. What am I supposed to do with it? <laughs> what am I supposed to do with it? Let's ask the Apostle Paul and we'll wrap up. He wrote the church at Colossae, and he says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. As you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And then once you get it in you richly, he says, as you teach and admonish one another. So after you get it, you share it. You teach and admonished. Did you notice that admonished? How when's the last time you enjoyed being admonished? It's not very fun sometimes, is it? And here's the thing. You can't give somebody what you don't have. I remember years ago, I had this analogy that just came to me. It was kind of for me personally. And I was, uh, at the time, kind of trying to balance uh, ministry, and I had not totally resigned yet from the uh, my regular job, and, and I was trying to balance everything, and, and, and I just kind of saw this picture, and I want to share it with you, and I'll close. I think that, that we, we're like a, um, a glass, like a, like a drinking glass of water. And I am like a glass, an empty glass of water. And this word which is Jesus, and Jesus, which is the Word. I need it in my glass to the top. And, and here's, here's where I'm going. I don't need to be giving anybody a drink of this water until it has surpassed the top of my glass. Because, you know, everything in that glass... I need for me to be healthy. 
Now, here's what God does. If I make my goal in life that my cup is never less than full, that, that in my week, I never, I never, I never let my cup get below that top. Then here's what he does. He adds his portion. And it flows over. Here's what I learned. What flows over the top is not for me. It's for you. It's for the people I meet this week. What's in the cups for me? I can't give somebody some drink if I'm thirsty. So I need, I need the living water myself. I need to be healthy to give you a drink. And what God does, I don't know how to overflow the cup. That's his job. I just drink deeply and often so that my cup is full, and he runs the cup over. And from the excess of that supply, I don't need that running over the top. I don't need that. So I got something to give you. I got something to give that person I meet at Walmart, that person I meet at the gas station. I got something. And what I've experienced in my own life is when it is overflowing, he'll put people around me who are thirsty. Isn't this cool? I'm not that smart. I don't know how to do that. But he puts people around me that are thirsty because he knows that I got extra. And that's what this, what was that last verse? I shouldn't have closed the book so quick. That last verse, it's a big book, by the way. He said, dwell in you, may the word of Christ dwell in you richly. You know what that means? To the top. Top. Let him run it over. But you get it to the top. And you know what that is? It's spiritual discipline. Study to show yourself approved, a workman thoroughly furnished unto all good works, rightly dividing the word of truth. Study. Study. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for giving us the cup to put it in. And then thank you that you run it over when it becomes our treasure. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all.